Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verse 1. Keep thy foot when thou goest in the house of God. <clears throat> and be more ready to hear. God's giving you two ears and one mouth. Then to give the sacrifice of fools. For they consider not that they do evil. It's stop and listen. James and, and Solomon speak the great errors, the great sins of the big mouth. And the sacrifice of fools is people say they're going to do something and they don't. I'll pray for you this week and you don't. I'm going to read the Bible. They don't. Come up and, and come to the prayer altar and, and get things right with God. And they come to the prayer altar and they make, uh, they make an, uh, an oath to God. They make a vow to God and they don't keep it. I tell you another one, another one you got. It, it's a rarity. I'm going to dedicate my baby. That de baby dedication. And then later, you know, they drop out of church. They drop out of serving the Lord, and they don't turn that that child to the Lord like they said they would. I'm going to do something. Be not rash, quick, hasty with thy mouth. The psalm is trying to tell us you got a mouth problem and let not thy heart be hasty to utter anything before God you know one of the problems with these invitations at the church at the end of the service is you got some people not all maybe not many you got some people who go up to the altar or they'll say something to God and they don't fulfill it. There are people called uh, wartime. Oh God, if you get me home and, and get me out of this battle and, and get me out where I am right now, I'll go home and I'll be that preacher mom wants it to be. And you arrive home safely and you come home, the war is over, and you never become that preacher. Jailhouse religion. I've been in the jail ministry six to seven, eight years. Oh, the promises that they had make, and it's like, don't do it. I had one guy tell me, oh, I'll never be back, Stiley. One week later, he was back. Some churches, in order to get somebody to, to the altar, get somebody up, unbelievable promises. Solomon says, read the scriptures. For God is in heaven, and thou art upon the earth, and that's what the book of Ecclesiastes is about, everything on the earth. Therefore, let thy words be few. Shut up. Preachers, as such as me as a street preacher. We have a big problem with our big mouths. We can't shut up. We're putting our foots in our mouth. Then he gives us a little illustration. For a dream coming through a multitude of business. It's a matter of thoughts and concern. You've got a business. you got a, 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 a job. And you're thinking and you're involved in thought and what am I going to do? How am I going to do this? What can I do? I got this client. I got this customer. And I want to make the best of my, co my business, my employer. And a fool, and a fool's voice is known by a multitude of words. There is the smart businessman he thinks, he dreams more than he talks. 
You know the number one thing that will get you in trouble in front of a judge? The judge will let you talk and talk, and you'll sink yourself. That's the truth. All right, here we go. Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verse 4. Oh, by the way, before we get to verse 4, John Wesley, you heard John Wesley, would only talk to a person for 15 minutes. Verse 3. At the end of 15 minutes, I have been told, he walks away. He figured anything over 15 minutes was not worth saying. There's a tribe somewhere in the world, I've heard, through my studies. And you can have all the time you want, judicial, in a court setting. And you can say whatever you want, however long you want to say it, but you must stay you must say it standing on one foot. And the moment your other foot comes down or you fall down, you're done talking. When thou vowest a vow unto God, oh if you get me out of this war, get me out of this battle, get me home. You know, the prodigal son made a vow. He said, I'm going to go to my father. I'm going to repent to my father. I'm going to say, Father, make me as one of your highest service. And that boy did exactly what he vowed to God to do. And he said, keep thy foot when thou goest to the house of God. Where's the illustration of that? That's the man that goes up to God, gets on his knee. Oh, I thank God I'm not a thief, man. I'm not an extortioner. I'm not a, this guy over here, you know, corrupt and stuff like that. And you look how great I am. Shut up. I've heard some men in churches, they get up and they're called upon to pray and they give you this, this prayer. Elegant, and you, you don't say nothing. You don't aim nowhere. I've heard preachers like that. I know of a preacher one time, and I described him as a saltine cracker in the desert. I know a preacher one time, we have we would have guest preachers come in, and the guest preacher, man, he'd preach and, and just set the place on fire. And then the preacher would get up, and I would, I, I would whisper to my wife, fire water. You say, what's fire? He put the fire out with his water. Because he would get up to the pulpit and he would critique what, what was preached by the, by the guest preacher. And not, he didn't need to say nothing. The Holy Spirit already did his work. He should have got up there, let things be, and then shut up. I'm learning that with, with, with the public ministry. Just, you know what? Styling, shut up. Ignore it. I'm learning that. Took me some time. When thou vowest a vow unto God. Defer, delay, put off, not to pay it. For he has no pleasures in fool. Do you take this to be your awful letter wife and awful letter husband? The death do your part? I do. I do. And you get a divorce. You didn't. You don't. Well, well, there's only one, one divorce that Jesus said in the Bible. In the gospel, fornication and adultery. That's grounds for a divorce. That's the Bible. No fault divorce. You made a vow before the preacher. You made a vow before your family. And you made a vow to God to death do his part. Neither one of you are dead and you are apart. You failed. And God says, no pleasures in fools. What does God call a marriage, a Christian marriage that failed? Fools. And better not go to that altar and say, I do, than to go to that altar and say, I do, and you don't. Fool. You know what that preacher should say at, the, at that wedding ceremony? Before I say the marriage vow, I want to make one point. Are you going to stick to these marriage vows? Do you die or are you going to be a fool and get a divorce? But right there, right under the, you, know, you know how they get out of that today? They don't 
have the marriage vows at all. They don't say, you know, obey, honor, and this and that. I said marriage vows twice in my life. And both my wives have died and gone on to be with the Lord. I look for a third time and I will say those vows and I will keep my part of the marriage to death do his part or rapture. It says, pay that which thou hast vowed. That's marriage vows. That's coming home from a war safely and well. That's going up before the church and saying, we're going to dedicate our daughter. We're going to dedicate our son. You do it. I'll be there when I do it. You do it. The best way that James says we're going to say something like that, if the Lord will. Lord willing. Because there may be circumstances beyond our control. I know a preacher, said, when you go up to him and say, you know, would you pray for me, pray for this preacher? That preacher says, I pray right then and there because I may forget later. That's a great response. How have you, have, have you told somebody you've gone to church have you said, or somewhere, you say, well, I'll pray for you. And then you realize you forgot. You don't even remember the name. You don't even remember the circumstance. You vowed a vow. You're a fool. You didn't pay. And God writes that down and he records it. He records vows been accomplished. Well done. The vow was broken. Did not do what they say would, they were going to do. Fool. Better is it that thou shouldest not vow than that thou shouldest vow and not pay it. God says, you ain't going to do it. Don't do it. Don't say it. Better for a bride or groom walk away from the wedding scene to say, you know what? Second thoughts, I really don't think so. Then pride and proud to say, well, I really, all right, I don't want to embarrass her. I don't want to embarrass them. I'm just going to say it and hope for the best. That's not the attitude. Suffer not thy mouth to cause thy flesh to sin. Shut up. It's cruel. Shut up. You know, I'm from Connecticut. I'm a Yankee. I'm not Southern. I'm a Yankee. I'm a Connecticut Yankee. You know what we say up in Connecticut? Eh, shut up. They don't say that down here in Florida. I'm trying to bring that up. I'm trying to bring it back. I'm trying to bring a little Connecticut to Florida. Eh, shut up. We got an attitude. <laughs> we don't want to hear. Eh, shut up. That's what Solomon's saying. If Solomon was from Connecticut, he'd say, eh, shut up. And he says, suffer not thy mouth to, to cause thy flesh to sin. If you're going to say something and not do it, you have sinned, you are a fool, and you have no character. Boss, I will get the job done. Don't you worry. And you don't get the job done. Your character has been ruined. Oh, yeah, I'll work for this company. I'll do everything I can do for this company. Oh, I'm sick. I can't come in. <laughs> okay, let's go have some fun. Let's, let's go to Disney, Rat Ryan. I called out sick. Hang out the water cooler. Ripe and complain about the job. Suffer not thy mouth to cause thy flesh to sin. And you got to go over the book of James. Neither say thou before the angel. I do not know what he's talking about. Now there's some that believe that we have, and it, it, it in the book of Matthew it, it stresses for children have a angel. And there are some that believe we have these guardian angels. And, I know there's angels over cities and countries and angels over the church and children. 
But the aspect here is that neither say thou before the angel. Angels are lower than God. And if you've got to speak to an angel, how are you going to speak to God Almighty? The God of the angel and the God of you. That it was an error. Well, look what it says. Suffer not thy mouth to cause thy flesh to sin. And you say, well, it was an error. No, it's sin. You know, they're shacking up. No, it's called fornication. It's addiction. No, it's called sin. It's called gluttony. It's not an error. It's not a crisis. It's not a psychiatric word. Of all the psychiatric words they got today for all the elements. It's not an error. It's called a sin. Don't call it what it's not. Call it what it is. I've sinned against God with my big mouth. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Why don't we just not say it in the first place? Or, Lord willing. Wherefore, where, wherefore should God be angry at thy voice? So, all right, to the angel, well, it was an error. To God, you get God angry. God got angry. Why should be angry? Yeah. Wherefore should God be angry at thy voice? You're a fool. You have sinned. And God is angry when you say, I'm going to do something or I'm not going to do something. And you do it or you don't do it. I'm going to, I'm going to death do his part. And you don't. I'm going to repay this loan. I'm going to sign my name at the dotted line. I am going to pay back this money. And you don't. I am going to rent this thing for one year. And I'm going to be faithful to one year of renting this thing. And you don't. And we're talking about not only oaths. We're talking about character. Character is what you are. When you're not around. That's why they have today credit checks. This is why they do personal checks on us. Because man has come so vile and wicked today. We got to check on what he really is than what he pretends to be. And you can forget about the suit and tie. Any criminal can put a suit and tie on. And you don't believe me, look at the world of politics and used car salesmen. And there are ministers and preachers and rabbis and priests that are with a suit and tie standing behind a pulpit deceiving the people. Friend, if you are in a pulpit and you are of the devil, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, I believe it is, you better shut your mouth and close up your church. House of God. Preacher, you better not be telling preacher stories and making those preacher stories your own personal study. Uh, uh, study your own personal story and reality it's a preacher story and don't fool me because i've been to preacher school i'm a doctor of theology your story that you fooled the people in the congregation i sit there like uh-huh i heard that in class that did not happen to you i've heard three preachers maybe four already come up with the preacher story And it's not an error, it's called a lie. And God gets angry. And destroy the work of thy hands. Second John says we could lose rewards if we greet and, and bless Jehovah Witnesses and their false doctrine. 
Solomon tells us if we say a vow, if we perform an oath, and we don't hold ourselves to that oath or promise, we can destroy the work of our hand. Wood, hay, or stubble. How many broken Christian marriage? I mean, they were married as Christians, not unsaved. As, how many um, broken marriages? And then the works that are judged at the judgment seat of Christ, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, or stubble, have been broken. Because you broke your oath. You broke your, your covenant. I'm going to fast for three days, and you don't. For in a multitude of dreams, here's that, dreams again, and many words, there are also diverse, different kinds, sorts of vanities. Solomon is saying, you know what? There's all kinds of people, and there's all kinds of dreams, there's all kinds of words, and there's all kinds of oaths broken. Every, everybody's broken their words sometime, some way, somehow. And he says an aspect of verses 1 to 7, he says, but fear thou God. If you will fear God, you're, you're going to think about that oath. You're going to think about that vow. And maybe you'll even catch yourself right in the middle. And then you'll seek God. Should I continue, Lord? Okay. Those are hard subjects right there. If thou seest the oppression, and we discussed that in chapter 4, verse 1. If thou seest the oppression of the poor, verse chapter 4, verse 1. He broke the subject. <laughs> and violent perverting. The only other word, time that word perverting shows up is in Luke 23 too. Violent re perverting of judgment and justice. Violent. In a province, in a town, in an area, in a confinement. When there is oppression, the poor are being oppressed, or judgment and justice is violently perverted. <coughs> evil is good, and good is evil. The guilty are set free, the innocent are charged. The criminal in America has more rights than the victim. Marvel not at the matter. Thomas says, don't let it bug you. That's norm. We also told him, marvel not, the world hates you. How and why are those, those people, they are oppressed? Why are they? Don't marvel. It happens. I can't believe that guy got off because he's a slip. Hey, marvel not. I can't believe people hate Jesus and they hate me. Stop your marveling. The Bible tells us it's going to happen. You know the law states for the Jewish person that they're not to afflict the widow and the fatherless, and yet they were? For he, God, that is higher than the highest regarded. You got, the, us, we in America, we got the Supreme Court. I think nine justices, I think there are. Five or nine, okay. And they are the highest court in our land. 
And when you get to the Supreme Court of the land, if they will hear your case, and whatever their ruling of their case is, that's final. But it's not final. We got a higher case. Look at Genesis 18, 25. There's a higher than the U.S. Supreme Court or any Supreme Court. Genesis 18, 25. Abraham talking to God. At the end of the verse, shall not the judge, capital J, of all the earth do right. When men won't do right, God, we got to rely on you. That's what the judgment seat of Christ is. That's what the great white throne judgment is. Do you realize when you got a pastor who favors somebody or, or some group of people in the church who do wrong, and you got Christians that do right, and they've been mistreated, you know, God will make it right at the judgment seat of Christ. He'll put down to those need to be put down and he'll exalt those that need to be exalted. What has been right will be made right and what is wrong will be made wrong. I mean, God's not going to do wrong. The wrong to the person. And the great white throne judgment, there, there, and yes, there have been people who've been put in jail wrongly. And God will make it right. And the person that should have been charged and wasn't charged, God will make that. That wrong, he'll make right. And humans make mistakes. And then sometimes the judgment and the judges, they've been blinded. They've been bribery, which the law says not to do. And there be a higher than they. The judge of all the earth. Moreover, the prophet of the earth is for all. The king himself is served by the field. That's that's social that's socialism and communism. That goes back to Adam and Eve. God said to Adam, Thou mayest eat of any tree of all the trees freely, except one tree. King Solomon, who is a writer of the Ecclesiastes, chapter 1, verse 1, he says, Listen, I was the king of Jerusalem. Even Solomon eats of the fruit of the trees, of the orchards, and the ground. And if he eats cattle, and if he eats, you know, sheep, they eat of the fruit, the vegetation of the land. I don't know what we eat today with the chemicals, where it comes from. But that thing right there, is, it's a thinking of social and communism. We all eat from the ground. He that loveth silver shall not be satisfied with silver. Gonna want more. The man that wins the lottery blows all his money because, you know what, he's not happy with the billion dollars. He goes out and buys $5 billion worth of junk, and now he's in debt. And he that loveth abundance with increase the more I get, the more I want, the more I get, the more I want. This is also vanity and emptiness. Solomon wanted silver and gold. He, man, it was as rocks in Jerusalem. He had an ivory uh, throne and he overlaid it with gold. He had 12 lions. He had one wife. He had two wives. He had three wives. 
He had four wives. He ended up with a thousand wives. He served God the Father. Then he served this small G God. Then he small. Then he served that small G God. Then he served that small G goddess. Then he served that small G God. Then he made this false altar. Then he made that false altar. And he built the temple of, of, of God. Then he built his own house. And then he built the house for, for Pharaoh's daughter. Then he built his judgment house. Then he built the house out in the... This is the man that's writing the book we're studying. When we read about men like Napoleon and Alexander the Great and Adolf Hitler, what are we reading about? Well, this country ain't good enough. Let's attack the next one. Well, this country ain't good enough. Let's attack the next one. Until they die or they meet a country that's more powerful than they are. There are people who are gone into the White House of America under our government system of voting. They don't go into the White House because they care about the people. They go, because I want the power. I want the control. See, I started off as governor in my state, and then I went to be in the Senate, or I went to be in the House. That's not good. I've got to make it all the way to the White House. So I can have the full power. That's what it is. When goods increase, they are increased that eat them. See, everything comes down really to the mouth. Jesus told the apostles, be content with food and raiment and water. Do we really need to have cell phones? Back when I was a gr boy growing up to listen, I didn't have I didn't have a cell phone till I worked to, for the newspaper. And I began the newspaper in 2000. And there was a time they were cell phone, they were getting ready to pay phones and I had to get a phone because where I was working, there were no more pay phones. But when I was a little boy, I grew up, I had in my wallet listen to this. I had four dimes, four dimes, 10, 40 cents, almost said 10 cents. Those four dimes was to make a phone call. When making a telephone call where you could ever find a, everywhere, you could find a pay phone anywhere and everywhere, and you put your dime in there and you dial the phone number. Man, telephone calls don't cost a dime no more, they're expensive. All the vanity of stuff we carry around today. And what comes down to the simple thing? If we were to go into a famine, you're not going to want a phone. You're going to want bread. If it comes down to a, a storm comes through, a tornado, a hurricane, and, and there's no power and, there, and there, there's just no life in this, you're not going to want the richest car. You're going to want water. And what good is there to the owners thereof saying the beholding or saving, excuse me, saving, note in my Bible, mark in my Bible, saving the beholding of them with their eyes. It comes down to food. You're not going to live and survive by your phone, your car, whatever other junk they have today. That's not going to keep you alive. The sleep of a laboring man, a man that works, is sweet. Whether he eat little or much, going back to verse 11, to eating, He doesn't have a 14-course meal. He has his breakfast, his lunch, and his dinner, and he may skip one. But the abundance of the rich 
will not suffer him to sleep. The man that works for a living, he, he, oh, I had a son. You know, it, it, there's nothing more for me. We go out on Saturdays and we preach the gospel. And there is nothing more for me to come home and just take a nap. Man, I preach. It was hot. And it's just, oh, I just hope what the Lord will do one day. And just take a little Baptist nap. A rich man. Do I lock all the doors? Did I set the combination? Is the security system working? Where is all my money? Is she going to divorce and take it from me? What are my children going to do? Are they trying to kill me so they get my fortune? What's my business partner doing? And they get ulcers and they get worries and they get anxiety and they got to pay money for a psychiatry. And he can't sleep. They said Elvis Presley, the, the king of rock and roll, he had trouble sleeping. He had trouble getting up. He had trouble doing this. He, and he needed medications according to his bodyguard. He needed medication to do whatever he needed to do and not do. Imagine how much money he would have if he didn't have to get the prescriptions in the doctors. So having all the money in the world is not going to really, it gives you more heartache. Because you're going to worry about your money.